Hello, my name is Paul Geyer and I'll be talking with you today about domestic wastewater treatment systems. This is what I'll be talking about, how I'll sort of be slicing up the information, the chapters in the book, whatever. Uh, some general comments, comments on site selection, Chapter 3, Treatment Requirements, and Chapter 4, Basic Design Considerations. By way of introducing myself, this is uh, just a little bit about what I've been doing for the last few decades. This introduction provides general information, illustrative guidance, and criteria for the design of domestic wastewater treatment. Criteria presented here is applicable to new and upgraded domestic wastewater treatment facilities and it provides information to determine the sizes of wastewater treatment unit operations. A wastewater treatment plant should be designed to achieve federal, state, and local effluent quality standards stipulated in applicable discharge permits. Specifically, the plant must be easy to operate and maintain, require few operating personnel, and need a minimum of energy to provide treatment. Plants should be capable of treating normal laundry wastes together with sanitary wastewater. Pre-treatment of laundry wastes will not be considered except where such wastes might exceed 25% of the average daily wastewater flow or as a resources conservation measure when feasible. In a design for the expansion of existing plants, criteria contained herein regarding flows and wastewater characteristics may be modified to conform to existing plant performance data if the plant has been in operation long enough to have established accurate data. In a design for the expansion of existing treatment works or construction of new facilities, the designer may offer criteria on new treatment processes for consideration. Pollution control facilities will incorporate the latest proven technology in the field. Technology is considered proven when demonstrated successfully by a prototype plant treating similar wastewater under expected climatic conditions. Treatment level obtained and operational performance and maintenance records will have been adequately documented to verify the capability of the process. With regard to site location, the major factors in the selection of suitable sites for treatment facilities include the following. Topography, availability of a suitable discharge point, and maintenance of reasonable distance from living quarters, working areas, and public use areas of the proposed facilities as reflected by the master plans. The siting criteria for the water pollution control facilities should consider state wellhead protection requirements for drinking water sources. In the absence of a state requirement, a minimum distance of a thousand feet should be maintained between a drinking water source and any proposed water pollution control facility. For on-site treatment systems, rainfall and soil characteristics are major criteria. Plants of 50,000 gallons per day or less treatment capacity will be more than 500 feet from the facilities when this minimum distance will not result in unacceptable noise or odor levels. Larger plants and wastewater treatment ponds, regardless of size, will be more than one quarter mile from such facilities. Greater distance may be required when such facilities are located on the leeward side of the treatment plant in areas subject to prolonged or frequent air stagnation or fog and mist cover and at a lower elevation than the treatment works with surface and groundwater flow from the treatment plant toward the occupied area. Exceptions to the 500 feet restriction can be made for cold climate module complexes where the treatment system is a part of the module complex. However, sewage treatment works will not be located within the same module as residential areas. With regard to septic tank systems, standard septic tank systems with subsurface drain fields do not fall under the 500 feet restriction. Distance reductions must not result in creation of unacceptable noise levels when plant equipment is in operation. Sufficient space must be allocated not only for suitable arrangement of the initial units and associated plant piping, but also to accommodate future expansion. 
Future expansion includes the provision of increased capacity for existing processes and the addition of new types of units known to be required for upgrading redesigned systems to the future requirements of more stringent stream and effluent standards. The site will be selected so that an all-weather road is available or can be provided for access to the plant. Available rail sidings will also be utilized when practical. Consideration should be given during layout of buildings, roads, fencing, and appurtenances to winter conditions, especially of snow drifting and removal. Considerable energy savings may result from partially earth-protected north walls, from solar passive collectors, and from proper insulation. Evergreen shrubs planted in the correct location may dampen cold prevailing winter winds, but if planted in an incorrect position can cause drifts or interfere with snow removal. Now with regard to treatment requirements, the general considerations are that before the treatment plant design is begun, treatment requirements need to be determined on the basis of meeting stream and effluent requirements set by either the U.S. or state governments or foreign government agencies for a plant outside of the U.S. For the standards, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency issues effluent standards covering the discharge of toxic and hazardous pollutants. Strict limitations on discharges of these pollutants must be imposed. Public Law 92500 with subsequent amendments requires pretreatment of pollutants which may interfere with operation of a sewage treatment plant or pass through such a plant untreated. Additionally, in many cases, pretreatment of industrial wastewater will be necessary to prevent adverse effects on the sewage treatment plant processes. Some types of industrial waste may be admitted to wastewater treatment plants, for example, cooling tower discharges, boiler blowdown vehicle wash rack wastewater, swimming pool filter discharges, and aircraft wash wastes using biodegradable detergents. Flow of industrial wastewater may be reduced through process modification or wastewater recirculation. Adverse impacts on the treatment plant may be mitigated by reducing the concentration of those compounds causing the problem. Table 3.1 is a listing of compounds which inhibit biological treatment processes. In some cases, the adverse impact may be caused by short-lived occurrences of either wastewater containing high concentration of compounds or a wastewater flow rate much higher than the average daily flow. This situation, which is commonly called slugs, may in some cases be managed by including an equalization basin upstream of the treatment plant. Table 3.1 provides a listing of pollutants that have an adverse effect on uh, biological treatment processes in a wastewater treatment plant. A few of the examples, for instance, copper, uh, one percent or pardon me, one milligram per liter concentration has an adverse effect on aerobic processes, those which are required to take place in the presence of oxygen, and one milligram per liter for anaerobic processes, which are processes that take place in the ab absence of oxygen, and nitrification, which is the removal of uh, uh, ammonia and nitrates uh, from the wastewater stream, 0 0.5 milligrams per liter. Others, uh, um, sulfates, uh, 500 milligrams per liter has an adverse effect on anaerobic processes. Uh, calcium, 2,500 milligrams per liter has an adverse effect on anaerobic processes. Uh, silver, uh, in a concentration of 0.03 milligrams per liter, has an adverse effect on aerobic processes and uh, then the other values that you see in this table 3.1. This is a continuous, uh, pardon me, a, uh, a continuation of table 3.1 for additional pollutants, uh, acrylonitrite, methylene chloride, cyanide, and so on and so forth, uh, total oils,
Most states require a minimum of secondary treatment for all domestic wastewaters. In critical areas, various types of advanced wastewater treatment processes for the removal of phosphorus and nitrogen may be imposed by the state regulatory agencies to protect their water resources. The designer must review the applicable state water quality standards before setting the treatment level or selecting the treatment processes. Local regulations in general, local governments do not specify requirements for wastewater treatment facilities per se. Construction of wastewater facilities must conform to applicable zoning regulations and OSHA requirements. With regard to preliminary treatment, it is defined as any physical or chemical process at the wastewater treatment plant that precedes primary treatment. Its function is mainly to protect subsequent treatment units and to minimize operational problems. Pretreatment at the source to render a wastewater acceptable at the domestic wastewater treatment facility is not included. Primary treatment is defined as physical or, at times, chemical treatment for the removal of settleable and floatable materials. Secondary treatment is defined as processes which use biological and, at times, chemical treatment to accomplish substantial removal of dissolved organics and colloidal materials. Land treatment can be classified as secondary treatment only for isolated locations with restricted access and when limited to crops which are not for direct human consumption. For the legal definition of uh, secondary treatment, see an appropriate glossary. Third, uh, advanced treatments. Advanced wastewater treatment is defined as that required to achieve pollutant levels by methods other than those used in conventional treatment, those being sedimentation, activated sludge, and trickling filter, for example. Advanced treatment employs a number of different unit operations, including ponds, post aeration, micro straining, filtration, carbon adsorption, membrane solids separation, and specific treatment processes, such as those for removal of phosphorus and nitrogen. Advanced wastewater treatment is capable of very high effectiveness and is used when necessary to meet strict effluent standards. Organics and suspended solids removal of over 90% is obtainable using various combinations of conventional and advanced wastewater treatment processes. Phosphorus levels of less than 1 mg per liter and total nitrogen levels of 5 mg per liter or less can also be reached through advanced treatments. Now for an evaluation of wastewater treatment processes. Table 3.2 provides a summary evaluation of wastewater treatment processes and tables 3.3 and 3.4 illustrate the applicable processes and their possible performance. All of the above will be used for guidance in selecting a process chain of treatment units which applies directly to the selection of treatment processes. Now we will look at an overview of treatment requirements using Table 3.2 as our guide. First, the preliminary treatment processes. The first is equalization, that is the equalization of the flow of waste streams with high variability. The advantages and capabilities of this uh, process are that it dampens waste variations reduces chemical requirements and dampens peak flows and reduces treatment plant size. The disadvantages are that it needs a large land area and there is possible septicity requiring mixing and or aeration. The second preliminary treatment process is neutralization. Its application is to waste streams with extreme pH values. The advantages and capabilities, it provides the proper conditions for biological, physical, and chemical treatment, and it reduces corrosion and scaling. The disadvantages is, uh, are that it may generate solids, and which will have to be removed, and then uh, it requires sophisticated equipment and instrumentation. The third preliminary treatment process is temperature adjust adjustment. Its application is to waste streams with extreme temperatures. 
its uh, advantages. Uh, advantage is that it provides proper conditions for biological treatment and the disadvantage is high initial equipment cost. The fourth preliminary treatment process is nutrient addition and its applicability is to nutrient deficient wastes. The advantage uh, is that it optimizes biological treatment. The fifth preliminary treatment process is screening. Its application is to waste streams containing large solids, pieces of wood, rags, etc. The advantage is that it prevents pump and pipe clogging and it reduces subsequent solids handling. The disadvantage is the maintenance required to prevent screen plugging and it's ineffective for uh, ticky solids. The sixth treatment process, preliminary treatment process, is grit removal. It applies to waste streams containing significant amounts of large, heavy, inorganic solids. The advantage is lower maintenance costs and erosion is reduced. The disadvantage is that the solids need to be disposed of and they are sometimes offensive. We now move to the primary treatment processes. The first is sedimentation, which is applicable to waste streams containing settleable suspended solids. The advantages are that it reduces inorganic and organic solids loading in subsequent biological units. It is by far the least expensive and most common method of solid liquid separation. It is suitable for treatment of a wide variety of wastes, requires simple equipment and operation, and has demonstrated reliability as a treatment process. The disadvantages uh, are there is possible septicity and odors. It um, may adversely affect, uh, very, be adversely affected by variations in the nature of the waste, and it requires a moderately large uh, area. The second primary treatment is dissolved air flotation, which applies to waste streams containing oils, fats, suspended solids, and other floatable matter. It can be used for both clarification and thickening. The advantages are that it removes oils, greases, and suspended solids. Less tank area is required than for a sedimentation tank and higher content of solids than sedimentation are uh, processable. It satisfies immediate oxygen demand and maintains aerobic conditions. The disadvantage is high power and maintenance cost. Now moving on to the secondary treatments. The first is activated sludge, which is aeration and secondary sedimentation. It is applicable to biologically treatable organic wastes. The advantages and capabilities is that it's flexible and can adapt to minor pH organic and temperature changes. It produces high quality effluent, 90% BOD and suspended solids removal. Um, BOD stands for uh, biological oxygen demand and is essentially a um, measure of uh, biological contaminants in the waste stream. Uh, a small area is required. It's available in packaged units. The degree of nitrification is controllable, the removal of uh, nitrogen from the waste stream, and it's relatively minor odor problems. The disadvantages are high operating costs for skilled labor and electricity. It generates solids requiring sludge disposal and some process alternatives are sensitive to shock loads and metallic or other poisons. And finally, it requires continuous air supply. The second secondary treatment process is aerated ponds with secondary sedimentation. It's applicable to biologically treatable organic wastes. The advantages are flexibility. It can adapt to minor pH, organic, and temperature waste changes. Uh, the construction is inexpensive. It requires minimum tension, 
and moderate effluent uh, removal is achieved, 80 to 95 percent of um, BOD removal. The disadvantages are the dispersed solids in the effluent. It's affected by seasonal temperature variations. There may be operating problems from ice, solid settlement, settlement, etc. There is moderate power costs, a large area is required, and there is no color reduction. Continuing with the secondary treatments, the next is aerobic, anaerobic ponds. Aerobic is a biological process that takes place in the presence of oxygen and anaerobic um, process is one that takes place in the absence of uh, oxygen. The applicability is to biologically treatable organic wastes. The advantages and capabilities of this process are low construction cost, non-skilled operation, moderate quality effluent, 80 to 90 percent, 95 percent BOD removal, a removal of some nutrients from wastewaters, and then the disadvantages and limitations are the large land area required, the algae that may be produced in the effluent, the possible septicity and odors that may develop, and weed growth, mosquitoes, and insect problems can be issues. The next secondary treatment is trickling filter. It is applicable to biologically treatable organic wastes. The advantages are moderate quality effluent, 80 to 95 percent BOD removal, biological oxygen demand. Next, uh, moderate operating costs, lower than for activated sludge and higher than oxidation ponds. And third, good resistance to shock loads. The disadvantages are clogging of distributors or beds and also small mosquito and insect problems may develop. Continuing with our discussion of the secondary treatments, the next is chemical oxidation. It is applicable to low flow, high concentration wastes of known and consistent waste composition or removal of refractory compounds. The advantages are the disinfection of the effluent, it aids grease removal, it removes taste and odor, and it removes organics without producing a residual waste concentrate. The disadvantages are the chemical cost, the high initial equipment costs, the need for skilled operators, and it requires handling of hazardous chemicals. The next secondary treatment is chemical mixing, flocculation, and clarification. It's applicable to waste streams high in dissolved solids, colloids, metals, or precipitable, precipitable inorganics and waste containing emulsified oils. The advantages and capabilities are that it removes metallic ions, nutrients, colloids, and dissolved salts. There is the possibility of the recovery of valuable materials and it provides proper conditions for biological treatment. The disadvantages are the sophisticated equipment and instrumentation that are required, the residual salts that result in the effluent, and it produces considerable sludge. The next of the secondary treatments is gravity filtration, which is applicable to waste streams with organic or inorganic suspended solids, emulsions, or colloids. The advantages are that it breaks down the emulsions and removes suspended solids. The disadvantages are the clogging that may result and frequent backwashing requirements. Continuing with the secondary treatments, the next is pressure filtration. It's applicable to waste streams that are high in suspended solids, such as sludges and organic solids. The advantages and capabilities is there is a high degree of solids removal, 80 to 95 percent. The disadvantages are high pressure costs, clogging, high pressure drop, power costs. The next of the secondary treatments is dissolved air flotation with chemicals, which is applicable to waste streams containing oils, fats, colloids, and chemically coalesced materials. 
The advantages and capabilities are that it produces a high degree of treatment and removes oils and greases. The disadvantages are high initial equipment costs, high operating costs, and the sophisticated instrumentation that is required and needs to be maintained. The next of the secondary treatments is anaerobic contact, which is applicable to waste streams with high BOD and or high temperature. The advantages are methane recovery, the small area required, and the volatile solids destruction that takes place. The disadvantages are the heat that is required, the effluent in reduced chemical form requires further treatment, sludge disposal, and the skilled operators that are required. Now we move to the uh, final category of wastewater treatment processes. These are the advanced treatments. The first is activated carbon adsorption. It is applicable to waste streams containing trace amounts of organics and color, taste, and odor producing compounds. The advantages are that it removes non-biodegradable organics from the wastewaters. It removes taste and odor producing compounds and it reduces color. The disadvantages are the high equipment costs, the carbon costs for pH adjustment, initial carbon and makeup carbon. Uh, there is no inorganic removal and wastes must be solid free to prevent clogging. Also air pollution is a potential uh, adverse effect when regenerating activated carbon. The next advanced treatment is microstraining filtration. Uh, its application is as a tertiary treatment uh, <clears throat> after primary and secondary. The advantages are that up to 89% of suspended solids are removed. It can produce final effluent of solids less than 10 milligrams per liter. The disadvantages are that it's very sensitive to solids overloading and it requires automatic controls and absorbent techniques. The next of the advanced treatments is land treatment. Uh, biologically treat its application is to biologically treatable wastes with low to moderate amounts of toxic substances. The advantages, uh, it's inexpensive, it requires minimum operator attention and generates minimum sludge. Uh, an advantage is water conservation, uh, another is crop production, and uh, there is a very high quality effluent and or uh, discharge. The disadvantages are the large land area required, the possible contamination of potable aquifers, freezing in winter, odors in summer under some conditions, and this is usually a minor concern. The next advanced treatment is subsurface disposal, that is deep well injection. It's applicable to solids free concentrated waste streams. The advantages are disposal of inorganics and organics. Uh, it, it is the uh, ultimate disposal of toxic or odorous materials. Disadvantages are subsurface clogging, groundwater pollution, high maintenance and operation costs, limited aquifer life, and high initial costs. The next of the advanced treatments is groundwater recharge, which is applicable to treated waste streams. The advantage is that it reduces bacterial concentration, conserves water resources, prevents saltwater intrusion into potable aquifers. The disadvantages are possible groundwater contamination, and it is limited to porous formations. The next uh, group of treatment processes are treatment processes for sludge, not for the wastewater stream. The sludge, of course, being the uh, bad stuff that is removed from the wastewater stream and it has to be disposed of. So the uh, treatment processes for the sludge the first is anaerobic digestion, which is applicable to biodegradable solids. 
The advantages are methane production, which is, a, of course, a fuel. Uh, the solid stabilization and conditioning. The liquefaction of solids. The minimum land area required and the use of digested sludge as fertilizer or soil conditioner. The disadvantages are the heat required, the process upsets when excess volatile acids are generated, odors that are generated, skilled labor requirements, and an explosion hazard because of the presence of methane. The next of the sludge treatment processes is aerobic digestion, which is applicable to biological solids. The advantages are relatively little odor, the solid stabilization and conditioning which takes place, and the unsophisticated operation uh, means that uh, relatively unskilled labor can be employed. The disadvantages are the moderate land area required, the high energy usage, and the reduced dewatering ability. The third of the sludge treatment processes is autoclaving, which is applicable to biological solids. Uh, advantages are that it is a compact operation. Uh, there is solids conditioning and it kills microorganisms. The disadvantages are high initial equipment costs, power costs, and skilled labor costs. Next we come to treatment processes for sludge. The next is elutriation, which is applicable to sludges with high mineral content or high alkalinity. The advantage is that it enhances solids conditioning and there are chemical savings. The disadvantage is the large volumes of water of low alkalinity that are required. The next process is vacuum filtration which is uh, applicable to organic or inorganic sludges. The advantages are that it uh, provides substantial solids concentration and the equipment is compact. The disadvantages are the high equipment, energy, and maintenance costs, the need for skilled labor for operations, the necessity for pretreatment such as for thickening and chemical addition, and limited throughput. Next is centrifugation. Uh, its application is to non-abrasive, non-corrosive sludges. The advantages are solids concentration, the compact equipment that is used, the low chemical conditioning requirement, and high throughput. The disadvantages are the expense of the equipment, which is high, the need for skilled labor, which uh, comes at higher cost, and the energy costs. The next treatment process is sand beds, which includes wedge wire and vacuum assisted sand beds applicable to organic or inorganic sludges. Uh, the advantages are the high concentration of solids that is achieved, uh, the low chemical costs. The disadvantages are the large land area required, weather problems that may occur in the winter freezing and in the summer odors. And the next treatment process is presses, which are applicable to organic or inorganic sludges the advantages being the high degree of concentration of solids that's achieved and the compact equipment that is used. The disadvantages are high capital cost and operating costs, the need for pre-coat and chemical conditioning, and the possibility that it's not applicable for small quantities. Now we come to a consideration of sludge disposal. This is after the sludge has been processed. Uh, first, incineration is a possibility both regular and using a fluidized bed. It's applicable to combustible organic sludges which are 25 to 33 percent solids. The advantages are that it's an excellent sludge volume reduction process, it kills biological organisms and the possibility of recovering uh, byproducts that may have value. Both heat and metals are examples. Uh, 
Disadvantages are the high cost of the equipment, the fuel and power costs, the air pollution potential, uh, ash disposal that is required, and the sophisticated equipment and instrumentation that is needed. The next sludge disposal process that may be applicable is wet oxidation. It's applicable to combustible organic sludges that are 3 to 10 percent solids. The advantages are that it produces an easily handled product, it kills biological organisms, and there is the possibility of byproduct recovery, and there is conditioning prior to other disposal techniques that may be achieved. The disadvantages are high initial costs, the fuel and power costs, and the high organic concentration in effluent streams. The next sludge disposal process is simple land disposal, which is applicable to stable biological sludge. The advantages are low investment costs. It postpones ultimate sludge disposal process installation or provides ultimate disposal if land is available. The disadvantage is the large land area required. And the final sludge disposal process that may be available is a sanitary landfill. It's applicable to dewatered biological sludges containing 30 to 35 percent solids. The advantages are the low investment cost, the fact that it is suitable for undigested sludges, odorous or toxic materials, and land reclamation may be a possibility. The disadvantages are groundwater contamination, it requires cover material and compaction, and the hauling costs. Table 3.3 provides approximate performance data for various wastewater processes. The processes that are discussed are the Imhoff tanks and rotating biological disks. Then the trickling filter processes, the activated sludge process, stabilization pond processes, and land treatment processes. The constituents in the effluent that are achieved as a result of these processes are provided in the uh, six columns uh, in the middle. And SS, of course, stands for suspended solids, uh, BOD, uh, biological oxygen demand and COD, chemical oxygen demand, both of which are uh, essentially a measure of the quantity of uh, biological contaminants in the uh, wastewater stream. Then the nitrogen <coughs> removal, the ammonia removal, and phosphorus removal. And then the last column on the right uh, indicates the waste that uh, must be disposed of. Table 3-4 indicates the operational characteristics of various treatment processes. The process characteristics that are discussed are reliability, expandability, the more stringent discharge requirements that may be required, and site considerations. The treatment processes that are discussed in this table are the rotating disks, trickling filters, activated sludge, wastewater treatment ponds, and land treatment. The required treatment is determined by the influent characteristics, the effluent requirements, and the treatment processes that produce an acceptable effluent. Influent characteristics are determined by laboratory testing of samples from the waste stream or from a similar waste stream or are predicted on the basis of standard waste streams. Effluent quality requirements are set by federal, interstate, state, and local regulatory agencies. Treatment processes are selected according to influent, effluent, constraints, and technical and economic considerations. Treatment capacity is based on the design population, which is the projected population obtained by analysis. 
The design population is determined by adding the total resident and one-third the non-resident populations and multiplying by the appropriate capacity factor taken from Table 4.1 for smaller communities, which allows for variations in the using population. The resident population is determined by adding the following. Table 4.1 provides capacity factors for populations from under 5,000 to 50,000, and the capacity factors range from 1.50 to 1.0, the larger capacity factor applying to the uh, smaller populations. With regard to estimating the future service demand, taking into account the nature of activities, uh, the nature of activities in a community are a very important factor in determining per capita waste loads because different activities have different waste uses. Table 4.2 illustrates this fact in terms of gallons per day. Uh, table 4.3 shows how waste loadings vary between resident and non-resident personnel. The values shown in Table 4.3 for that person of the portion of the contributing population served by garbage grinders will in be, be increased by 30% for biochemical oxygen demand values, 100% for suspended solids, and 40% for oil and grease. Contributing compatible industrial or commercial flows must be evaluated for waste loading on a case-by-case -case basis. For illustration purposes, Table 4.2 indicates examples of per capita sewage flow for certain types of facilities. The types that uh, are represented here are hospitals and other residential, and the breakdown is between permanent residents and non-residents. Table 4.3 gives examples of sewage characteristics. The characteristics that are discussed in this table are suspended solids biochemical oxygen demand and oil and grease, and the breakdowns are provided for residents and non-resident populations. The rates of sewage flow at installations vary widely throughout the day. The design of process elements in a sewage treatment plant is based on the average daily flow. Transmission elements such as conduit siphons and distributor mechanisms will be designed on the basis of an expected peak flow rate of three times the average rate. Clarifiers will be designed for a peak hourly flow rate, for example, 1.75 times the average daily rate. Consideration of the minimum rate of flow is necessary in the design of certain elements such as grit chambers, measuring devices, and dosing equipment. For this purpose, 40% of the average flow rate will be used. The average daily wastewater flow to be used in the design of new treatment plants will be computed by multiplying the design population by the per capita rates of flow determined from Table 4.2 and then adjusting for such factors as industrial wastewater flow, stormwater inflow, and infiltration. Where shift personnel are engaged, the flow will be computed for the shift when most people are working. A useful check on sewage volumes would be to compare water consumption to the sewage estimate neglecting infiltration, which will be considered subsequently. About 60 to 80 percent of the consumed water will reappear as sewage, the other 20 to 40 percent being lost to irrigation, firefighting, washdown, and points of use not connected to the sewer. Good practice requires exclusion of storm water from the sanitary sewer system to the maximum practical extent. Infiltration must be kept to a minimum. Both must be carefully analyzed and the most realistic practical quantity that can be used in design must be assigned to these flows. Leakage of storm water into sewer lines often occurs through manhole covers or collars, but this usually is no more than 20 to 70 gallons per minute if manholes have been constructed and maintained properly. However, leakage into the sewer mains and laterals through pipe joints and older brick manholes will, will increase in, with increase in groundwater levels can result in large infiltration. The amount of water that actually percolates into the groundwater table may be negligible if an area is occupied by properly guttered buildings and paved areas or if the subsoil is rich in impervious clay. In other sandy areas, up to 30% of rainfall may quickly percolate and then lift groundwater levels. Infiltration rates have been measured in submerged sewer pipe. 
relatively new pipe with tight joints uh, still displayed infiltrations at around a thousand gallons per day per mile while older pipes leaked to over 40,000 gallons per day per mile. Sewers built first usually followed the contour of water courses and are often submerged while more recent sewers are not only tighter but are usually built at higher elevations as the system has been expanded. In designing new treatment facilities allow for infiltration. Utilize existing flow records, sewer flow surveys, and examine the correlation between recorded flows and rainfall data to improve the infiltration estimate. The economic feasibility of improving the collection system to reduce the rate of infiltration should be considered. Another method for calculating the infiltration component of total flow is to multiply the miles of given pipe size and condition by the diameter in inches and to sum the inch miles. The sums of inch miles of pipe estimated according to conditions are then multiplied by factors between 250 and 500 to obtain gallons per day. If infiltration is known to be negligible in manholes, then an infiltration allowance may be calculated based upon areas served in Figure 4.1. Curve A should be used for worse conditions when pipes are old and joints are composed of jute or cement. Curve B applies to old pipes with hot or cold asphaltic joints or for new pipes known to have poor joints. Curve C is used for new sewers where groundwater does not cover inverts and when joints and manholes are modern and quite tight. Of course, field tests may be conducted to more closely estimate infiltration. Figure 4 is the curve indicating infiltration allowances for the different types of pipe. Average wastewater flow is usually expressed in million gallons per day but will be calculated in the appropriate units for design of the unit process under consideration. Contributing populations in calculating the contributing populations use 3.6 persons per family of residential units. In hospitals count the number of beds plus the number of hospital staff eating three meals at the hospital plus the number of shift employees having one meal there. This total is the number of residents to be used in the design calculations. Individuals will be counted only once, either at home or at work. The capacity factor still applies in calculating design populations. Industrial wastewater flows will be minimal at most installations. When industrial flows are present, however, actual measurement is the best way to ascertain flow rates. Modes of occurrence, continuous or intermittent, and period of discharge must also be known. Typical industrial discharges include wastewaters from the following. The wastewater treatment plant itself, maintenance facilities, vehicle wash areas, uh, cleaning buildings, boiler blowdowns, swimming pool backwash water, water treatment plant backwash, cooling tower blowdown, firefighting facilities, photographic laboratories, medical or dental laboratories. Including stormwater flows is important in treatment plant design either when combined sewer systems are served or when significant inflow enters the sewer system. Separate sewers are required in new systems and only sanitary flows are to be routed through treatment plants. For existing plants that are served by combined sewer systems, capacities will be determined by peak wet weather flow determined from plant flow records. In the absence of adequate records, hydraulic capacities of four times the dry weather flow will be used in the design. Suspended solids and organic loading can be interpreted as population equivalents when population data constitute the main basis of design. Typical population equivalents were given in Table 4.3. These equivalent values can also be used to convert non-domestic waste loads into population design values. The effects of garbage grinding will be incorporated into population equivalent values when applicable. The waste stream to be treated at existing installations should, when feasible, be characterized. This actual data should be used in the design. A capacity factor taken from Table 4.1 is used to make allowances for population variation, changes in sewage characteristics, and unusual peak flows. The design population is derived by multiplying the actual population, called the effective population, by the appropriate capacity factor.
Where additions are proposed, the adequacy of each element of the plant will be checked without applying the capacity factor. When treatment units are determined to be deficient, then capacity factors should be used to calculate the plant capacity required after expansion. However, the use of an unnecessarily high capacity factor may so dilute waste as to adversely affect some biological processes. If the area served by a plant will not, according to the best current information, be expanded in the future, the capacity factor will not be used in designing treatment components in facilities serving that area. The following equation may be used to estimate total flow to the sewage plant where domestic, industrial, and stormwater flows are anticipated. X equals A plus B, where X equals total flow to the sewage plant. A is the flow from the population, the, which is the effective population times 100 gallons uh, per person per uh, day, plus times the capacity factor, and the B is the infiltration plus the industrial wastewater plus the storm water, which is four times the dry weather flow. The wastewater at existing facilities should be analyzed to determine the characteristics and constituents as required. Analytical methods will be given in the current edition of the American Public Health Association publication Standard Methods for the Examination of Water and Wastewater and is approved by the Environmental Protection Agency. For treatment facilities at new installations which will not generate any unusual waste, the treatment will be for normal domestic waste with the following analysis. pH 7.0, total solids 720 milligrams per liter, total volatile solids 420 milligrams per liter, suspended solids 200 milligrams per liter, settleable solids 4 milligrams per liter, biological oxygen demand 200 milligrams per liter, total nitrogen 30 milligrams per liter, ammonia nitrogen 15 milligrams per liter, oils and grease 100 milligrams per liter, phosphorus 10 milligrams per liter, and chloride 50 milligrams per liter. Concentrations are presented uh, in milligrams per liter, which is equivalent to parts per million. These values represent an average waste and therefore should be used only where detailed analysis is not available. When the water supply analysis for the installation is known, the above analysis will be modified to reflect the normal changes to constituents in water as it arrives at the wastewater treatment plant. Changes will be as follows. Phosphorus in water supply plus 12 milligrams per liter e equals phosphorus in plant influent. Chlorine in water supply plus 8 milligrams per liter equals chlorine in plant influent. Total nitrogen in water supply plus 12 milligrams per liter equals total, total nitrogen in the plant influent. Non-domestic wastes are stormwater, infiltration, and industrial contributions to sewage flow. Stormwater and infiltration waste loadings can be determined by analyses for the constituents of normal sewage as presented previously. For these types of flows, the major loading factors are suspended solids, biochemical oxygen demand, and coliform bacteria. Industrial waste loadings can also be characterized to a large extent by normal sewage parameters. However, industrial waste contains contaminants not generally found in domestic sewage and is much more variable than domestic sewage. This is evident in terms of pH, biochemical oxygen demand, chemical oxygen demand, oil and grease, and suspended solids. Other analyses such as for heavy metals, thermal loading, and dissolved chemicals may also be necessary to characterize an industrial waste fully. Each industrial wastewater must be characterized individually to determine any and all effects of treatment processes. And that brings us to the conclusion of this brief discussion to, of uh, domestic wastewater treatment. I hope that this has been uh, about what you were looking for and has been of some help to you and make you perhaps a little better prepared to deal with uh, these wastewater issues as they come across your desk in the future. So thank you very much again and uh, have a nice rest of the day.